I'm, my head is full of um, conversations we've been having in the break, um, and I don't really know whether I'm going to do justice to them in the presentation that was prepared earlier, but hopefully we can kind of pick up some of those useful things we'll be talking about. But it's really nice to be um, in, a, in a session that's focused on communication to talk about advocacy, because um, it kind of gives you a bit of a chance to talk about the, the why and the how of it, the sort of principles of what, what we do and why we do it. Um, and essentially, I mean, advocacy is one of those external relations um, things that CIFA does that always feels like it is um, sort of instinctually, instinctually supported across the membership, but also not necessarily terribly well understood by everybody, kind of interpreted in different ways. I think there's, you know, an element to which it's fair to say it's not necessarily the most transparent of processes all the time um, and can be a bit of a movable feast, you know, there are different ways to approach it. Um, so I wanted to kind of do a bit of that why does CIFA do um, advocacy and how does it do it as, an, as a bit of a jumping off point for some discussion afterwards about, um, you know, what the communicative goals are and, and, and how we achieve them. So just to start from some first principles, so advocacy is one of the avenues for CFIS communication, um, and it is the main method that we have to communicate with a number of certain external audiences, like politicians, government officials, um, agencies. Uh, advocacy activities are also for, um, one part of our communication, um, communication with other professional sectors. So you saw Lizzie's um, uh, uh, at Vox Pops in the previous previous session. Um, you know, particularly where we are communicating and collaborating on working in parallel on influencing government, but that also has the the kind of communication communicating with those other other organisations as well. Um, so the simplest one-line description of what advocacy is, is that it is a process through which we aim to influence change. So we influence change to tangible things like legislation or policy, um, or to less tangible things like people's attitudes or priorities or positions on things. Um, often CIFA takes, uh, CIFA's advocacy takes the form of a kind of direct approach uh, to decision makers. So it can be kind of thought of as a traditional form of lobbying. Um, and we do this by providing authoritative advice through both formal and informal channels, um, looking for kind of pragmatic opportunities to raise things that are on the Institute's agenda. Uh, but it can just as easily be a, um, a method of achieving outcomes or impacts from other activities that CIFA might undertake, like research. So there's no real firm line between the, the kind of traditional lobbying that Pete and I largely do, and some of the work that lots of other CIFA staff do. So Cara this morning was talking about apprenticeships and influencing government guidelines on apprenticeships. That's advocacy as well. So there's no firm line drawn around um, uh, what's advocacy and, and, and what's kind of wider form of communication. Okay, so in this session, I'm focusing on why. Why does CIFA do advocacy? Um, and it must be said that you know, various different professional institutes approach advocacy in a variety of different ways. Some go for it extremely heavily, a uh, kind of core aspect of what they do. Some do it much, much less. Um, so it's not necessarily that advocacy is implicit in the role of a professional body, but gratifyingly, um, it doesn't seem like CIFA members have a, have a challenge with, with the principle that CIFA should do advocacy. And that's a graph just from the last 2020 survey of members shows pretty clearly that members support um, the fact that CIFA does do advocacy, but it doesn't ask them why they think we do advocacy and it doesn't go into that in any more detail. And I suspect within that 90% figure, you'd find a range of reasonings. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of say, have this kind of general sense that there are things that need changing and somebody needs to be the voice for archeology. span and I think that's a, that's a good starting point. So there are clearly many aspects of archaeological work that are influenced fundamentally by externalities. So uh, we can draw a kind of pretty clear line between the goal that we have to encourage professionalism, things that we've drawn from the key messaging, um, 
to, and and uh, those systems, those wide, the wider world of systems, policies, and laws that kind of create the necessary conditions that allow us to do that. So the second question is is kind of the response is a res one of our responsibility. Um, it's if not us, then who? Um, because CIFR is one voice among many in the archaeology sector, but we're in a pretty privileged position when it comes to the fact that we've got some options to put resource towards advocacy. So relatively speaking, we've got the resource to do this. Um, and thirdly, um, I think that as a professional institute, we've got a really strong representative authority based on the collective expertise of our professional membership. Um, and that provides a really great plas platform when you are asking people to listen to you. And it's really important for kind of having power in, in, the, in the, the, the realm of, of lobbying. Okay, so just looking at some of these things in, in a bit of detail. So um, there's a feeling that we need to do advocacy in the profession. So how do we decide what we advocate on? Um, and I think there's a matter of process that's really helpful to sort of explain to members. Um, so in addition to the strategic plan, the key messages, the hierarchy that, that Stephen was talking about before, there are um, a set of advocacy objectives that CIFA have. Now these are set annually by CIFA's board uh, with advice from the advisory council um, and they provide the basis of the authorization that CIFA staff have to go away and do particular things um, with a reasonable attitude but also with accountability. Um, so the objectives pay attention both to the need for change, but also the likelihood of outcome. Um, so they can be kind of proactively led by that need or reactively led by that opportunity. So the things that the government wants to talk about, you may be more likely to achieve an, out an outcome in those, those issues. And that helps us to kind of prioritize what to talk about, how much resource to put to what. Um, we do have a really pretty broad scope of interests um, we may be leaders on particular issues and we may look to support others where there uh, is other expertise in the sector to bring to bear that's better than ours. Um, and then at some point, there's a question of the kind of limit of our authority to speak on advocacy. Or is that? I don't know. Um, it was interesting to hear the, in the session this morning about um, questions around diversity, questions around climate from Hannah. Um, and how do, we, how do we take a view that, as an individual member, we might have views on climate change, views on the planning system, um, and where does our platform, where does our authority to speak as archaeologist, expert in, expert in what we do, end? So uh, really interesting questions around that just coming out of the session this morning. Okay, so we've got three principal objectives. I'm going to read them backwards because it just helps with the way we are in, in this session. So the third one is that we um, ensure that work is done by competent, competent professionals to professional standards. It's something that CIFA leads on, straight into the key messages. The second is that we maintain or advance in the interests of the public and clients the quality of archaeological practice, an objective we share with some others, but increasingly tend to lead on. And these are the things that most kind of tie into that kind of core um, professional institute role and the key messages. And the first one is an objective to maintain and improve the protection and management of the historic environment. It's pretty general, and that's an objective we share with, with many others. Um, and then beneath these, princi these principal objectives, there are a suite of advocacy objectives. And the current list looks like this. Um, so on that list, you've got core issues related to promoting professionalism, like seeking to make sure that Professional, uh, professional accreditation is normalized into um, organizational policy or, or, or government guidance. Then you've got the kind of key systems that dictate how archaeology gets done. So that's your heritage protection, your planning policy, um, local authority service provision, and other regulatory frameworks like marine, forestry, agro-environment. And then there are a couple of kind of wider societal moving parts. So things like skills, training, um, immigration, how do we get the skills that we need, and there are various systems that are implicated by that. Um, and then there's a sort of slightly more internal form of advocacy, the kind of sector organisational stuff, the influencing strategies, make sure that we as a sector are pursuing our goals collectively um, in, a, in a good way. Um, so you can sort of see that there's key messages throughout there. 
Uh, but there is some, some degree to which I think we take a little bit of latitude in CIFA on policy areas that are pretty, that are more just generally about assuring good outcomes for the historic environment. So that is part of it as well. Okay, so as I say, you hopefully get kind of sense of that accords with the key messages. Um, they also reflect a kind of ethical duty that I think we can perceive to change the rules when those rules aren't working to serve those professional professional objectives. Um, and, and, and a kind of important one, I think, we know it's necessary because without the kind of advocacy tactics that, that we and others employ, archaeology can and does get overlooked. Um, you know, even with the best will in the world, the people who are out there making policy are not specialists in archaeology and, um, and, and they do tend to forget about it from time to time. So just as an example, to illustrate that, um, over the last three or four years, we have been following around the UK governments, um, uh, governments' processes to replace um, agro-environment schemes for post-Brexit era. Um, and in the past, in Wales, which is the example I'm using, cultural heritage has been included uh, in the scheme so that heritage assets can be identified and protected within schemes, a uh, range of possible outcomes written into the, the agro-environment scheme. So we followed the post-Brexit kind of consultation development from, from the, the Welsh Government through 2018 through 2019, two documents, two consultations, which we responded to. And in those documents, it seemed perfectly implied that um, that would continue. And then in 2021, the white paper was published um, and there was no explicit mention of culture and heritage. And in fact, in the impact assessment, it, it says our proposals do not target culture and heritage. And so somewhere in that sausage machine of government, someone had made the decision that this wasn't relevant, this wasn't going to be in this in scheme and dropped it without warning. So CIFA sort of scrambled to, to, to action on that and, and kind of got in touch with our contact at CADU to say, right, what's happening here? They said, we don't know either. Um, and we were able to work together with CADU to kind of seek, seek um, uh, face time with Welsh Government, have meetings with Natural Resources Wales who'd be developing the scheme. CIFA went along with CADU to some of these meetings to present the case for archaeology to say, hey, look, guys, we think you might have made a mistake here. And uh, and it, the, the outcome was that actually we got listened to quite intently, a series of meetings with the bill team to put this back into the scheme and to improve it, in fact. So now you'll find in the new bill, uh, the, the, the agriculture bill that was published last year, kind of more references to how the historic environment can be brought into the scheme, more ex uh, public, public benefit, more public access, all of those kinds of things. Really successful process. We're doing the same in Scotland at the moment. As it happens, we'll see whether we can be just as successful up there. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is CIFA's authority. Um, and I think this is probably the most important one. CIFA has a really strong position, I think, for undertaking advocacy in the sector. And firstly, you know, CIFA works in the public interest, and that is demonstrated by um, by our Royal Charter platform, and that's something that external audiences can understand very easily. Um, that kind of gives us a strong sense of legitimacy to provide that independent oversight on policies and, and systems related to our work. We also represent over 50% of practicing archaeologists in the UK, so we've got that, that real representative streak that, um, that means that when we bring our expert views to government and other audiences, that that, that is backed up. And I think that that demonstrating of how we back that up is really, really important. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, so foremost is that um, we maintain a list of advocacy advisors with special expertise in, in, in particular areas that can be called upon when there are relative, um, um, relevant issues. Um, so our, our, our advocacy objectives are you know, purposefully broad so that they can account for things that come up um, that, that, you know, if you to make the, the advocacy object is too tight, you might struggle to respond to the, the language of government of the day. But it does leave us with you know, gaps to fill when it comes to deciding exactly what CIFA's position on things should be. Um, we've got about 40 regular advisors at the moment on this list. I'm really keen to kind of develop that further. So I was talking to Maria in the break about uh, registered organisations and, you know, trying to start to, to, to expand out the, 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 the part of that 
role that CIFA has when working with the ROs to say, hey, we can help represent you in, in advocacy if you bring us your expertise. We can help put you in the rooms with the ministers and the, uh, the uh, issues that you're interested in. So I want to kind of develop that through our advocacy advisor process and, again, increasing the legitimacy of the positions that we take and the things that we say. So also consult with special interest and area groups. Um, and when there are particularly knotty issues, we can put something on the agenda of the advisory council. So you're getting that democratic feedback from the from the institute's governance structures. Um, and very occasionally, the advisory council won't be able to agree on a policy position, we'll defer to the board and present the evidence. And I'll say, this is the thing we need to say or not. Um, so all of those democratic governance structures are involved in underpinning the legitimacy of CIFA's advocacy. And I think that is really important. Um, and a last element, which is not to be overlooked, although it's not necessarily the same as the influencing what the policy position is, is how we communicate this process and the positions that we take out to the to the membership. So um, I think I probably is a, is, a, is a cycle that self that that fulfills itself. The more that we are able to tell members what we are doing in the name of the institute, um, the more likely they are to be interested and engaged and offer their, their expertise and feed into the system again. Um, so in the last couple of years, we've, we've run CPD sessions and workshops on particular um, advocacy issues. People can drop in and say, hey, I heard they were scrapping the planning system and archaeology is going to be out on its ear. And we'll say, sort of, but not quite. And let's have a chat about that and sort of skill up the, the, the attendees at those sessions. And I think those have been really useful. But um, the point I'm trying to make with all of these is that um, CIFA's advocacy should never just be what Rob thinks or what Pete thinks or what any individual member of CIFA staff thinks. That would be a really, really bad way to do advocacy in the name of the Chartered Institutes. Okay, so just another quick example that illustrates some of those points. Um, the UK maintains what they call a shortage, a UK shortage occupation list um, that is managed by the Migration Advisory Committee, the group that the advisory group that um, provides advice to government on, on these issues. It's been around for, uh, for years, but it, it kind of took on a more significance for archeologists post Brexit with the removal of freedom of movement um, and the, the new sort of creation of, of um, skills pressures that had arisen during the boom period that we've been going through for the last few years. Um, now this was not an issue, the, the shortage of occupation list immigration in general, not an issue that had been on CIFA's agenda before then. So um, CIFA worked with various other bodies, chiefly FAME and ALGEO, um, and representatives from um, the registered organisations, um, particularly those employers who were interested in signing up to become visa sponsors under the new government scheme. Um, uh, we set up meetings to discuss with the advisory council as well as other individual members with specialist interests and with organisations like Prospect so that we could kind of tease out what the best policy position for CIFA to take would be. Um, because one policy position might raise issues for domestic training, um, wages, and you know the like. Uh, the result was that we um, we had we arrived at a policy position that would that would put CIFA to pursue a place for archaeology jobs on the shortage occupation list, which provides a number of benefits to people wanting to employ from outside the UK post Brexit, and we were able to achieve that. Um, and we're just about to head into a process again now where we can, with the, the shortage occupation list is being updated and have a review of, um, of that policy position. Okay, so the final point is um, why CIFA does advocacy is about, is about responsibility. Um, so as I said before, there's, there's lots of organisations um, that are voices in the sector for archaeology. Um, and, and many of them have got similar cases to make about their legitimacy, their authority, whether it's a learned society or a charity or whatever. Um, but there's, if there is a critical limitation in the archaeology sector that is widespread, it's resources. Um, and CIFA is one of, if not the only national body um, that has the ability to put resources, significant resources towards its advocacy work. Um, and with that resource, uh, comes, you know, from, from having me work full time and from having other staff able to, to pull resources into these kinds of uh, events comes the ability to monitor 
news, some monitor announcements to keep a kind of constant liaison with um, with external colleagues, whether that's in government or in other organisations, to gather evidence together and to sort of instigate the the kind of conversations with our own. Uh, RO colleagues and, and other organisations in the sector um, and to share that out, to share that intelligence out to make sure people are aware of things. Um, and where we don't lead on particular issues, we aim to be really helpful partners uh, to promote uh, or assist what others are leading on, um, whether that's, you know, UA UK talking earlier in the opening session, great to see Lizzie championing us as a, as a positive contributor to the Heritage Alliance. Um, so CIFA's ad advocacy sort of spider webs out through many other relationships. Uh, Pete, in the opening session, flagged the, the memorandum of understanding we've got with the Council of British Archaeology, which focuses on our advocacy partnership. And that basically means that um, CIFA and CBA are able to kind of bolster each other's authority uh, uh, and pretty much work hand in glove when it comes to joint responses to things so that anything that we put in on a planning policy uh, consultation comes with the, the combined authority of our two organisations. Um, and those, I sort of feel like um, the more of the sector that we can reach through these kind of positive relations, the better we would be, the stronger we would be. Um, so yeah, I think that the there's an element of it as well, which I think I would really like to see CIFA acting as an enabler for sectors, uh, the, the sector's advocacy. Um, and, and with that in mind, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the advocacy foresight work that CIFA has been doing um, in the last year. And this is work we undertook to sort of survey all the bodies in, in archaeology who have an interest in uh, doing advocacy. Um, and it kind of looked at organisational priorities, but also kind of capability and activity levels, um, as well as sort of trying to draw people into a conversation about how we collaborate, what improvements we could make as a sector to how we, how we do things. Um, now, it made a set of recommendations that focused on promoting a more sort of strategic approach to advocacy by individual organisations, um, identifying a wider interest in advocacy from organisations that have tended not to be um, sort of at the forefront of sex as advocacy or potentially that they've only just recently decided to step into the role like many of our RO colleagues in the last few years, Wessex Archaeology, Molar Archaeology in particular have decided that actually they do want to bring their voice to bear to government. That's something that we're very keen to encourage and bring them into the kind of sector discussions that we have. Um, and, you know, the, the report also talks about how we kind of improve trust between those organisations, how we make it so that we can work more speedily and more uh, with more trust in each other, that we, we're, we're talking the same language and we have the same objectives. Uh, so the report's not published yet, uh, but hopefully you will kind of hear more about it in the coming 12 months. Um, now, I think CIFA has a pretty thorough approach to, to how it does its advocacy. And I think that I think what we do is really defensible. And there's a real strong breadcrumb trail that can be traced back to the kind of legitimate um, legitimate footings for, for who we are and, and what we're trying to achieve. I think my kind of top desire would be to improve that wider um, that wider relationship across the sector to make sure that we're 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 all with it together. Okay, so um, discussion. I've put up some bullet points here that I haven't had time to to sort of discuss at in length. So if any of them take your focus, uh, ta 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 take your fancy, I will talk about why I think these bullet points illustrate interesting questions. But if you don't want to, then ignore them and I'll pass back to, uh, to, to the room.